Hi, this time I wanted to talk a little bit about my new book that I'm currently researching called Islam's Gandhi. Many people often ask me why I'm writing such a book. Well, several years ago I spent three years living in uh, Egypt in Cairo and as a product of uh, Western culture, ostensibly Christian Western culture, um, I was subject to the same sort of uh, skewed, biased media coverage of Islam and Muslims that uh, all of us in the West are subject to. Now, it's not easy when you're living in a culture to put aside that uh, influence and reject it entirely. Uh, you can be aware of it, you can be aware of the fact that you're not getting the whole truth all of the time, but it's difficult to, to pull yourself out of that culture and look at, and look at um, the truth with objectivity and impartiality. So when I went to Egypt, um, I did go with some trepidation, I have to admit, but when I arrived I was, I was really, really pleasantly surprised and pleased uh, to see that um, Muslims are actually very much dedicated to an incredibly beautiful religion. Islam seems to me, and I'm not a Muslim, so you know, I'm, I'm working on my own impressions from the outside here. Uh, Islam seems to me to be a religion of peace. It seems to be an example of active living spirituality. And an example that we could all learn from, in fact. I would not say that you need to become a Muslim to learn, learn this lesson from Islam. <clears throat> but what it seems to represent to me is an example of how to engage with a, a philosophy, a way of life, um, a spirituality that can have genuine, deeply felt meaning for you as a person. In Cairo, um, on a daily basis, I was presented with people stopping at prayer times to pray wherever they happened to be, in the street, the car park, the shopping precinct, um, doesn't matter. If, if it was prayer time, they would put down their mat, they would stop, and they would pray. And no one turned turned an eye and thought that they were a bit odd in doing so. They would that would happen in the West if you know someone stopped for a quick prayer at the side of the road, um, they would be considered a bit strange. Not so in Muslim cultures. Now I don't know whether Egypt is. Um, a perfect example of the Muslim culture or not. It's the, it was my first encounter with Islamic culture. Um, and I was incredibly impressed, um, not just by the people themselves, uh, but by, the, by, by their living example of their faith. Um, Islam seems to me to have an awful lot to offer to the West. Uh, it's, it, 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 it has always offered very much to the West. We've taken very much from Islam and, and Arabic culture, in fact. Um, and I think we can learn. We can still learn very much from it. Now, having seen this, having been so impressed with the way Muslims present themselves in terms of their commitment to their faith, their genuine desire to find a personal engagement with God and to improve themselves as human beings, uh, which at the end of the day, let's face it, that's what all religion is about. We're trying to become better people. Um, it just it struck me that you know we really don't give we don't give Islam a, you know the proper opportunity in the West. We don't we don't allow it to breathe, we don't allow it to express itself. And that, in some ways, needed to be addressed. Now, I'm writing this book because um, I feel that somebody has got to do it, and it can't be a Muslim. A Muslim writing a book like Islam's Gandhi will just be passed off as a bit of Muslim propaganda. It needs to be written by a Westerner. It needs to be written by a non-Muslim. I have no axe to grind on this. I don't care whether you convert to Islam or not, frankly. But what I do care about is the fact that Islam, as a, as a religion of peace that has so much to offer the rest of the world, is vilified so thoroughly in the West so often. And um, I think 
if I can do something to turn that tide a little, then I think I have a duty to do so. Um, I'm currently in Khartoum in Sudan conducting this research and, and the book is about a guy called Mahmoud Mohammed Taha. Uh, Taha was a near contemporary of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and was like Gandhi very much involved in the uh, struggle to end British rule of his country. Also like Taha, uh, sorry, also like Gandhi, Taha was very much um, committed to his faith. He was a, he was a he was a shining example of, of Islam at its best, really. Now I, he he was a Sufi and he had therefore a lean towards the mystical expression of Islam, and I know that might grate against the nerves of some more traditional uh, interpretations of Islam, but that's that's. You know, well beyond the remit of my interest and certainly of this book uh, but Taha did present an amazing picture of, of how Islam um, <clears throat> how Islam can actually uh, have something of value to offer the, the rest of the world and certainly his own country here in Sudan um, he was a pacifist. He believed in equality between all peoples, women, men, didn't matter what strata of society they came from. He, he believed passionately in equality, that all human beings were born equal in the eyes of God. And he, 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 he dedicated himself to bringing, bringing that, that equality uh, to his own country. He tried to bring democracy to his own country. He tried to bring a pacifist agenda to his own country, but more than this, he tried to, to, to bring an example of how spirituality can work in unison with politics and not become overbearing and dominate politics to the point where it destroys individual freedoms, which has happened so many times all around the world when religion interferes with the political agenda. Um, also like Gandhi, uh, Mahmoud Mohammed Taha um, his, had his life ended prematurely. Now Gandhi was assassinated. Taha was actually executed by his own government. Um, not this current Sudanese government, but the last uh, Nuneri government. Taha died in 1985. He was he was uh, arrested, put on trial, and executed. Uh, the current government uh, did eventually declare that. Um, arrest, trial and execution illegal. However, the man's dead and there's, that, that can't be changed. But um, what we do have in Taha, what we still have and what we will have for a very long time is the example of a man who, who um, proclaimed to his nation and proclaimed to the world that Islam can make a difference, a positive difference in people's lives and and improve the quality of their lives immensely for his belief and for his passion in peace he was eventually killed um, as, as is so often the case around the world but it seems to me that Islam has very few modern, modern heroes of global stature in the West we know about Gandhi we know about Mother Teresa but we don't know about many modern Islamic heroes Mahmoud Mohammed Taha was a modern Islamic hero um, and he's, he deserves to be on a pedestal up there with Gandhi. We should know about this man. We should have a better impression of Islam and how it can really have a, have a positive contribution to, the, to make to the world. We in the West are losing so much by not listening to the, to, the, to the truths and the depth of knowledge that is available in Islam and Islamic culture. Um, we've rejected something that... Is, is profoundly spiritual, profoundly important, has actually uh, influenced and fed Western society for a very long time. So I think you should take a look at this book. I think you should take a look at Mahmoud Mohammed Taha and realise that Islam too has its heroes. Um, I'll speak to you again fairly soon. Take care.